Welcome to Spiritual Awakenings International Presents. I'm Dr. Yvonne Kaysan, the president of Spiritual Awakenings International. Uh, hello and welcome. Hola y buenos dias. Bonjour et bienvenue. Herzliche willkommen. Grüezi. Buongiorno. Bon dia. And aloha. <laughs> SAI is truly an international network, which is why I welcomed you in eight different languages. So welcome, everyone. We love to know where people are joining us from. So why don't you take a minute now and put into the chat where you are joining us from today. Our guest speaker is joining us from Mexico. Uh, we have someone from Toronto. Welcome. Um, I'm in Encinitas, California right now. Uh, we've got people all over the United States, England, wonderful, welcome, Chicago, Roberts from Oregon, Smith Falls, Ontario, welcome people from all over the world, Plymouth, UK, how wonderful, we're <laughs> real international, Canary Islands, well, hello, <laughs> we love to have people all over the world joining us, and Clara from Texas, welcome, so, uh, I'm now going to introduce you to the Vice President of Spiritual Awakenings International, Robert Baer, who is going to be uh, giving you some opening remarks. Robert. Thank you, Dr. Kaysan, and, and welcome, everybody. It's a real honor to have you here, and it's a real honor to have Anna Cecilia Gonzalez speak. Uh, she's going to do a marvelous job uh, for us. Uh, first of all, uh, we are an international organization, and yeah, we're in 64 countries, and we stream all over the world, but there are some people in our audience that I wanted to acknowledge, and one is one of our Circle of Honor uh, individuals, Dr. Francis Liu. It's a real honor to have you here, Dr. Liu, real honor. And also, we have some advisory board me uh, members here for Spiritual Awakenings International. One is Francisco Valentin, who with Anna Cecilia Gonzalez and Dr. Ingrid Honkala, they are our SAI Espanol network. Uh, and Anna Gonzalez is, Anna Cecilia Gonzalez is the chairperson for our committee, our Espanol committee. Now, some uh, housekeeping items. The format of the meeting is such that all everybody's muted except the speaker. We have a question and answer period at the end of, uh, of the presentation. And, and if you use the chat to put your questions in, that would be appreciated. Dr. Kaysan will handle the uh, question and answer period a little later on. And um, I wanted to also acknowledge, I forgot to acknowledge Tamara Calder Richardson. I just noticed her and a dear friend of ours, Linda Truax, who had been our board secretary uh, when we first initiated Spiritual Awakenings International. Welcome her to, welcome to Linda. Now, SAI, Spiritual Awakenings International is donation-based. If you have an opportunity, please go to our website and hit our donate button. All donations are greatly appreciated, and we want to continue to have these presentations free to everybody around the world. Now I'm going to give this back to Dr. Kaysan. Thank you once again, everybody, for coming. Thank you, Robert. So it is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, who is Anna Cecilia Gonzalez from Mexico. And uh, Anna Cecilia was uh, born and raised in Monterey, Mexico, but she was born with a very serious congenital heart um, condition and all the doctors thought she was going to die. It had a very poor prognosis, but inexplicably she survived. I look at it, it was the divine plan for her to survive. Anyway, she had repeated uh, SDEs and probably NDEs in childhood and repeated encounters with what she as a child called the death ghost, but later found out that it was actually an angel that was looking after her. 
And she never talked about any of this until she wrote her wonderful book, When Life Is Not Forever in 2015. And this great book is available in English and in Spanish. Then in 1989, she had um, another open heart surgery and she had both a respiratory arrest and a cardiac arrest. And she had a, a powerful and fascinating near-death experience with these arrests, as well as several encounters with angels that I'm sure she's gonna tell us about today. The love and messages she received during these events changed her life completely. So since 1990, She's had several repeated and ongoing NDE, STE after effects, such as out-of-body experiences and communications with beings through her dreams. And um, she's received more than 100 different important messages, she says, through her dreams. And when she shares them with the people involved, they confirm that the information is true and has great meaning for them. So it is my great pleasure to introduce Anna Cecilia Gonzalez. Thank you so much, Dr. Yvonne. Thank you, Robert. Thank you for having me here today. I'm, I'm really very excited. This is, this is something very special for me because I'm gonna tell you that before I share my screen, many, I'm gonna share with you part of my life journey and many of the things I understood that I had gone through were thanks to SAI, to Spiritual Awakening International because I had the privilege to translate the page, the site to Spanish. So while I was doing that, I understood that many of the things I went through had a name and they were real and they, they were they was something that existed. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that. I'm very grateful because of that, being part of Spiritual Awakenings International. So let me share my screen. I, I, I wanna apologize because this is a, I changed computers and maybe there was a little bit of a red line on top, but I hope you don't miss the message, which is the most important thing. So I call my, my talk, Life Goes On. This title is very important for me because since I was a little girl, this is me when I understood that I was really, really sick. And I, I said, there's, there's gotta be something else. And I understood at a very young age that there, there was something that made my made the difference in me. And I remember my, my dad, when I understood, it was exactly this stage when I, when I knew that I was very sick and that there was probably, I could die soon, I understood it. So I remember my, my father saying, well, this is what doctors say, but what if God has another plan? So there's where everything's uh, for me. So life goes on some other way or what happens. So that's why I called my book when life is not forever. At that age, I understood as a little child that I might lie. So I said, what does a child seven or eight years old do? When you think at that moment that life's forever. I mean, you never think about death at that time. So what, what do you do when you know you're gonna die? So for me, there were, there were several options that I'm gonna talk about in a minute. These are my parents, just a little bit before they knew I was, I was coming on the way. So you see they're a very, very happy couple and they're beautiful and young and everything. And then just after I was born and they were told that I was very, very sick. This is the day of my baptism. Just look at their faces. Just imagine all of that energy, everything that's going around must have been something that I, that I in a way or another got, because I am absolutely convinced that children get a lot of information, even from what parents don't even say. So there's a lot of things around that, but you can just see these uh, phases and they're just, well, they're nervous because they have, they're holding me, that little baby, and they told my, my parents, we don't think she's gonna be more than seven or eight years old, older than old, because most probably she won't even get out of the crib. The most, uh, I, I be, we believe that she might die at around seven or eight. No, she's not gonna make it. And the worst they told them is that my heart condition was not compatible with life. And my heart condition, just if there's any doctors here, it's uh, I have a transposition of great vessels, one single ventricle and pulmonary stenosis. 
So at that time in 1964, it was just not compatible with life. So I call this my spiritual awakening when I understood the diagnosis and the prognosis. This is this is this little girl that wants to live a life and I'm just convinced that there's probably something else. But I was four years old and this is around that age, probably four or five. When I had probably one of the first that I acknowledge, that's why I say Sai helped me to understand this. I was uh, very, very sick. My parents had to leave me in the hospital uh, because uh, we, at that time, there were not really a lot of hospitals that could take care of a problem like mine. So we, went, we had to travel to Mexico City and I was left alone with a lot of children. Parents were not allowed to sleep with the children at that time. So I was left in a crib, in a very deep crib, so I wouldn't go out because I was about four. So I remember at that time, uh, I didn't want to be alone. I remember shouting to my parents that they were mean, that they were bad because they were leaving me there. Just imagine this little girl shouting to their parents. My parents, of course, my mom was crying all around because why were they going to leave me alone with a lot of other children? And I was just, I mean, I just wanted to go and have a life with them. And why? Because at that time, I don't know why, but they don't really explain a lot, even though I asked. Now I recommend parents that whenever a child asks something, you have to give them an answer. I understood something was going on, but I didn't understand why. Wasn't my sister with me or my younger brother with me? I was just there left alone. So one of my, my the, the, you just saw the baptism. That was my godmother. She gave me this little doll, which I called Dora, just like her. And I've kept her. This is my doll. I still have her with me. And for me, that was one of the first nights that I understood that there was something different. And I was just four years old because um, they left me and they left me with a doll I held. And this was just a modern doll that you just uh, pulled a, a little cord and it cried. You know, this little doll cried. So I was so sad. I, I don't remember. I still, uh, at this age, I remember. I don't remember having a most, uh, the saddest moment I remember as a child was at night. So the only thing I could do to to make myself feel better was make her cry because I was so tired of crying because I had no oxygen. So I was, you can see my lips here are a little bit purple. Well, when I was crying or all of my nails, I'm gonna show you in a little bit, everything was absolutely purple. So I, sometimes I even fainted. I went out because I was so, so sick. So I remember that since uh, I was so tired, I made her cry. So if she had to cry or I had to cry, but somebody had to cry because I was sad. So at that moment, a doctor came and they were trying to comfort me. So they started playing with my doll. And then while they were playing, they broke her. So she couldn't cry anymore. And it was devastating for me. And I said, what did you do to her? So I just wanted to hold her back. And he felt so bad because I was really suffering. I'm going to fix it. Just he gave, he gave me a popsicle. He gave me something so I could just try to feel, make me feel better. And he took my doll. And that night was the one that I said, I felt so lonely. And when I was crying at that moment that I believe that I was one of the first conscious moments that I felt a beautiful light came around me and I didn't understand what was happening. I just knew I was alone. There was no doll. There was no doctor. There was no mom and dad, but something comforted me. There was something there that just made me sleep. And next day I was just hoping for my mother to come for something to happen. So for me that night, that was a very special night because I remember, you remember it as a very sad night but at the same time, I felt some kind of company that I didn't understand. So next day, the doctor came, my parent, and of course, he couldn't fix my doll. I just took her back, but I just said, I'm never going to give it to anybody again. And then my mother came with me, and I, the only thing I, I wanted to be is with her. So I remember she, she, she telling me, oh, you broke your doll. 
And I said, no, mom, he was a doctor. I said, oh, come on, don't lie. If doctors don't come here to break dolls. So, you know, all of these things you start feeling in your life, like he doesn't believe me, you're four years old. Nobody's, so it doesn't matter. I just know I'm, I'm okay. So those were, those were the, the moments I started talking a lot to myself, trying to know that there was, there was something else going on. And then this is what, what I call raffle. That, this beautiful, well, for me, it's a beautiful angel. At that time, I didn't understand it was an angel. Uh, I remember always, even in that first night I, I was talking about, there was somebody there. Somebody, and this is a drawing I wanted to show you because since I started writing and drawing and doing everything, I always draw this same picture over and over again. All I didn't even know why or how, but I wanted to show This is the first time I show it because I remember this when I was a, a very little girl drawing always a little face like this. And then when I was in prime school and then in high school and then in college, and every time I, I was just thinking or I was just sad, I always draw it. But I want to tell you about this, this uh, why did I name him Rafael? Because in Spanish, there's, we have this female name and this ma male name, Rafael or Rafaela for a male. So since I didn't know it was a male or a female, somebody that was there all the time, I just decided not to put a female or a male. So in Spanish, it makes sense, it's Rafael. I understood many years later that in Catalan, you know, Spanish language, this is the way, the name for Rafael. And then I understood that this is an archangel. And this is the archangel of health or everything that has to do with, with health and medicine and all of this. I didn't know any of this until I started writing my book. And believe me, sharing this for me is just so important because sometimes we have spirits, people, uh, all this, uh, I call him, I thought he was a ghost. And I, I remember crying out loud, don't take me away. I still don't want to go. Please don't take me away. I was so sick at sometimes. I just remember this, this red light. I constantly saw, I mean, this green light. I constantly saw it around me when I was very sick. I now understand it was my raffle around with me. So when I was a very little girl, I constantly, I was close to death at many, many moments. I'm sure I had many, what we call spiritual transformative ex experiences, SCEs, constantly, because I was so sick that whenever I wanted, I wanted, I still, nobody understood how I was alive, but I wanted to, to run and I wanted to climb and I wanted to do everything every other child did. And I tried, I tried everything, believe me. But then I got so tired that I turned purple. And what I, without even understanding how life worked, I thought I understood that breathing made a difference. So I remember as I was a very little girl sitting myself like that. I mean, of course, this is not me, but this is what I did. I just stopped and started breathing. And I remember trying, asking the, sometimes I even went to bed and lay down like this and just without understanding anything i just said okay blood i even named her i named her lucy i said okay lucy lucy because i don't know it, it had a meaning for me then but i said i told this my blood you have to go to the lungs just go to the lungs and get all the oxygen you need so my nails can be back in because I, they, I'm gonna show you in a minute, they turned absolutely blue. All of my, my body turned blue and I, I just couldn't breathe anymore. I sometimes, I'm sure I went out of my body. I had very difficult experiences then. So I knew that breathing helped me a lot. So without knowing, I started meditating and breathing at a very young age. And I told my blood, just go back so I could go back to play. And sometimes when I was growing up, and this is something also I want to mention, I know now that I had this 
STS experiences because I was probably like this little girl, she's probably five years old. And at that age, I was at school, my parents sent me to school, talking to my, my, do- my teachers all the time, telling them that whatever I got sick, just call them, that I could just sometimes even went faint- fainting because I got so tired. So I remember once we were in a, this, uh, this was like a play that we did in Mexico when we, we were trying to rep- represent how we discovered America and there was this flag and then the Indians and it was all the representation of our flag. And of course the Indians don't wear shoes. So my nails were really, really deformed at that time. So the least thing I wanted is to show my nails and my feet nails were even worse. So my mother always, uh, she would make sure that I was always covered. But at that time in this show, and the teachers didn't know how that was so hurtful for me. So I just had to take off my shoes and I was wearing a beautiful bow. And then my mother had just, the, how do you call, I don't know the word for, uh, the, do you, it's a trenza in Spanish. Well, she just did a beautiful, uh, she really caught me and I was just um, wearing some little flowers and everything was just so beautiful. I thought that people would concentrate on that. So we were just sitting there, just you couldn't move. And then parents started, started walking. And the first thing parents and children did it was just look at my nails because they were so notorious. I could hide my na- the nails of my hands, but not my feet. So I remember this, this is when I understood what happened with me. And I just wanted to hide my nails. And the teacher said, no, 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 you have to stay straight, don't move. So it, it hurt it so much that in, inside my mind, I went, I went out of my body without knowing I was doing this. And I went with my grandma for, to ask her to comfort me. So I went with her and I, 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 I went to her house. I even felt all the smell in her house, the, the way it smelled. She, they had a, a place where they uh, raised chickens and everything. So they, there were a lot of eggs with her all the time taking care of that. So I started helping her fix the big eggs with the small eggs and just for her, for her to sell them. And while I was doing that, I remember feeling her embracement and saying, telling me, you're so beautiful, don't worry. But I was with her, I felt love and I went back with her and I really felt so comfort. And when there was a moment in which I said, okay, it's enough. I remember her hugging me. We were laying in the couch, all this was, out of my body and then she said just remember just such a beautiful girl and I felt the way I went back I opened my eyes and the teacher was saying okay we're over let's let's move let's go so I didn't understand what was happening now I do that I was just going out and this happened very often because it was sometimes so hurtful so for me life life started to have a very different meaning when I understood that life meant so much more than just, than just being alive or having nails that were like everybody's or having the best doll or the best uh, everything around uh, what we consider important. And this is this, the, the picture that you see on top is the same one I showed you at the beginning. This is me looking my, at my mother and the rest of my siblings. And it is a very notorious picture for me because I'm not looking at the camera. I'm looking at what's important for me. And I don't want to cry. But the important things for me is at that moment were precisely having a family, having all these things that we treasure. And I didn't know. Well, I, I started knowing at that time they were so important. Oh, God, I was not expecting this, Ivan. <laughs> anyway, it's touching uh, for me because life did start having a very different meaning at that time. And I was constantly with doctors. Hold on a second. I was constantly visiting doctors constantly. And I remember looking at doctors in a different way. I was just thankful that they were there for me. And all the time, all the time, 
there was always raffle around me. I remember many moments, and I'm gonna show you this picture. These were my nails in my hands and in my feet. And they were probably, the feet were even worse. At many moments, uh, I'm, talk, I'm calling this hypothermia because at many moments when I was uh, trying to swim or I was doing different activities, I constantly went frozen. I mean, I had this hypothermia and I covered myself trying to warm me up. And at those moments, I just went again out of my body. I didn't know this until now that it has, I, that was an SE. And I remember seeing Raffle and I, I was talking to him constantly. Please don't take me away. I don't want to leave now. That's why I call him go, the ghost. Uh, I just, he was a ghost that was going to take me away. My, the, the ghost of death. I said, since I'm about to die. But this time I was probably around eight or nine. I understood perfectly that I was very sick. And that, that I, sometimes like I was saying, parents say much more with what they don't say. And I understood they were, they were constantly worried about me and they, I could see their fear. So I remember talking to Rafael and saying, please don't take me away, not yet. I still have a lot of things to do. So these moments were constantly in my life, trying to Rafael, well, Rafael was taking care of me, but I, I didn't know that. One of the things that I want to mention also, for me, this is, has, been, has been one of the big purposes God has for me in my life. We're having such beautiful parents that in a way really raised me the way I needed to be raised. My mother, this is my mother, and this is me at around four. And she held me, she never, they never stopped helping me visualize my life. So even though I was sick, then we were, I was there talking to her about my dreams, about everything I wanted to accomplish. And I remember that I was very young, said, I wanna, I wanna grow up and I wanna graduate. I wanna have a degree. And one day I wanna get married and I wanna, I, I wanna have a baby. And then I was just thinking about all those process, having, being able to raise her. And then I wanted to have a, a whole family and then I adopted a little boy. And then this is, I started working with my family in the family business, but all these things I'm showing you now, I was just visualizing them when I was that young. And then I'm giving talks all around the world now because I've been in several parts of the world doing, sharing my story now. And then my daughter got married, all these things, and then is when I understood that being happy was my choice. But what I wanted to share with you is that all of this strength came from this, probably my dad started with that, what if God has another plan? So I knew that there was something else much more behind whatever thing we could accomplish. So after that, uh, that I was telling you before, before I had my beautiful near death experience, I was constantly having this conversation with spiritual beings. I uh, thank God I was able, I, I grew uh, probably at 15 years old is when my, my doctors told me that they recommended I, that I just don't, don't they, they, they saw I had a boyfriend. I was so young, I thought, and that was my nails and everything was sometimes so ugly that I just thought I was never going to have a boyfriend and that I was never going to be able to get married or to have children, all those dreams that I had. And I remember when I was 15, I went to the doctor. I was very sick at that time. And I was still alive, thank God. I went to Houston, Texas, and then they asked me, I see where you have a boyfriend, but I, we just hope you're not planning on, on having a, a sexual relations. Have you started? And I said, Oh no, I'm I'm still too young, and you know, in Mexico, well, we're, I'm not married. How can I have a sexual relation with someone? So it was just like scary to me for them to ask me. But said, they told me, doctors, told, they, this was a private conversation. Please don't start with that. Don't, don't. You you're not going to be able to have a, a sexual relation. You're not going to be able. Please don't get married. Don't have children. You're not going to make it. 
And I remember at that time, my dreams were so strong. My spirit was so strong and I just felt strong. I didn't know, didn't understand how or why. And I remember saying, well, what do you know if you're not me? And I was, I mean, why are you gonna, this, for me, this was like a, a death sentence. And then my, my mother came in and they asked me, what, what did they tell you? What, what's gonna, what are you gonna do? Are you gonna be able to get married? And all those things she wanted to know. And I said, this is part of my book. I really recommend you to read. The, the title of that book is, I Lied. And this lie was so important to me because I said, yes, mom. The, the doctor said there was no problem. My mother didn't really understand English. So that was on my side. I was, that was my benefit because nobody could really understand what the doctors were saying but me. And my father understood a little bit, but he was not there. He, he was out of the country. So I said, mom, they said that I don't have to worry. My heart will stop me, but I, that I, my life, Life went on. So that's why life goes on. So I didn't want to stop it. It was a decision I made also in my heart. And there's a saying I've always said, and I don't know if it sounds so good in English, but it's that whenever death finds me, I want her to find me very alive. You know, I want to be very alive whenever I die. So this is the way I've been living my life. So I was, I, I, I got married just against all odds. I got pregnant against all odds. I had a beautiful little baby. She was four pounds, a very small little baby, but she was perfectly healthy. That's the girl you, you're, you, you're, you'll see in, a, in another picture next. But uh, she was perfectly well. She was just very, very small. And then is when my heart really got very sick. So I knew this and this, this uh, spiritual conversations I wanted to mention this because I remember one night, uh, I knew my heart was really, I couldn't even uh, climb up the stairs to take care of my baby. She was about seven or eight months old. And I just said, I just can't take care of her. I was so sick. And I remember one night talking to Raffle and then just getting in this beautiful meditation and just saying, God, the only thing I want is to just go to you. I want you to tell me what do you want from me? What am I supposed to do? Just tell me, please tell me, because I don't want to leave this child alone, but I just want to know what is your will. So there is where I got so sick, I had to go to the hospital and uh, I went to Houston, Texas. My, my heart was really uh, very, very sick. There was, I was uh, around at 60% oxygenation in my body. There was, uh, I was, uh, had no strength to do many, many things. So when I was there, this is my, my first open heart surgery. I've had two. This was my first. Nobody, doctors couldn't even believe I was alive. They said, but how, the first thing they did when they checked me up is, how did you dare have a baby? And I said, well, I asked God and he gave her to me. For me, it was a, an easy answer, you know, but because that's the way I had been living my life. I was strong inside. I was, there was a lot of faith in my heart. I, I believed that things, and my mother helped me to visualize my life. So I'm almost, I'm convinced that that gave me the strength I needed to keep myself alive. And it did. And doctors now, I mean, after, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my, about my book. But one of the things that doctors told me is, and that's what I'm doing now is, he said, we don't know how you're alive, but you have to tell your story. And because your story is what has to make a difference in others. One of the first thing I, I, things I tell you is never stop dreaming. Never stop looking for what you want in spite of whatever circumstances you're going through. And mine was life-threatening. So I, I was very sick. I was um, at a... Um, I, they, I had a, the first surgery and something happened inside that, that uh, my, th there was a lot of uh, blood and a lot of, uh, I, there was no way I could breathe anymore. There, there was a leaking inside. So I was very sick. They, they had to put me into, an, I had to enter into another surgery real fast. It was a very, very difficult moment. 
So before I went into another surgery, because they were, they were trying to take off, to take away all the liquid around my heart. And they found out it was, it was a, there was a very big serious bacteria in it. But when they were trying to do that, they pinched my heart, so it started bleeding. So I had to go back to surgery as an emergency. And at that moment, I understood I was going to die. I mean, I knew it. So I remember in that moment, Raffle walking by my side. I, they were just, I remember I said goodbye to my parents, to my husband, and I was just saying goodbye to everybody because I knew it. But when I was walking through there, maybe it was three minutes, two minutes, I don't know. But I remember having a very long conversation in my head with Raffle. And I said, okay, I'm with God. And I said, you know, I'm ready. If this is it for me, I'm ready. It's okay. I'm, I'm ready to leave. I just please ask you to take very good care of my daughter and of my husband and my parents. I know they're suffering. But if there's by any chance a possibility for you to leave me, I promise I'm going to raise a beautiful little girl. Just give me the chance. And I remember saying, saying to Raffle, hey, Raffle, long time no see because that was he again. And I said, wow, so you're still here. Please, Raffle. I know you're not gonna take me because you didn't do it before. So just please talk to whoever you wanna talk, but help me if there's a, a, a slightest chance I can stay, please, I, I promise I will raise a beautiful girl. So I was just like bargaining. I don't know how to, how to say it, but I was just trying to make it, uh, to make, I still wanted to have a life. And I wanted to see my daughter again. It had already been around a month in the hospital and I had not, you know, we didn't have internet. There was no, you cannot use your phone to see her. There was nothing to, for us. She was just too far away from me. And the only thing I had always on the front of my bed, I had her little picture. That was everything I took with, with me all the time. So at that moment, they went into, I went into the, the second surgery. I, ha I had after this a heart arrest and a respiratory arrest. Uh, something happened that a phlegm went into the tube I was in tube, and they were, there was no oxygen getting inside. A, a lot of doctors came in. They tried to, to this, do CPR on me. My, 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 resp my, my respiration stopped, and then my heart stopped. And then I remember them. I was, it was hurting too much because everybody was trying to hold me because I was so desperate because since, since you're untubed, they hold your hands so you don't take the tube out. So I was just trying to get away because I was just so desperate because I was awake at that moment. They were waking me up to the surgery. But as, just after that, this happened. So at that moment, I felt immediately how I went out of my body, just like this. This is a beautiful picture that represents exactly how I was feeling. But the thing is that there were about 15 doctors around me at that time. And I, I saw that, I saw me there, but I knew I was here and I said, well, I don't really understand what's happening, but, but I feel okay. So everything must be okay. And then I just saw the doctors working on my body. And then suddenly I just turned up and I saw this, what I call a tree. For me, trees are very important. I always, when I was a little girl, I remember saying, at kindergarten that if, uh, if I wanted to be something of nature, what would I like to be? And I said, I want to be a tree. Why? I don't know, but maybe this has the meaning it had for me, but I wanted to be a tree. And I felt like if I, I went inside the tree, and this is a beautiful scenery I started seeing, and then I started floating. And while I was floating, I remember feeling released. There was no pain. There was a lot of peace around me. I was just feeling so strong. And then, and, and a lot of air could come into my lungs. Everything was different. And I remember the first thing I saw were like, there was like branches of little animals. I saw little squirrels, rabbits. I mean, all, everything, little birds, all in nature was just beautiful. And I was just looking at that and, and it was a lot of peace. It was just uh, amazing. The, 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 the feeling I had around all this 
beautiful nature. I was look, and the colors were so bright. I, I went up inside this tree and a lot of other branches and I saw tigers, lions, elephants. And it's just like if I could touch them, it was, th their colors were, and it was, I was not afraid of them. And it, I was just enjoying this scenery so much. And at the same time I started, I went back and I could see my body there, but it was okay. And then I started looking everything around in a very different way. And I saw where my daughter was. I didn't know at that time, my aunt Martha was taking care of her. And then I saw her, she was in the crib. I saw my parents, they were, they were praying a rosary at, at the waiting room. I saw them there doing that. And then I saw my husband climbing up the stairs, up and down, up and down. I didn't know all of this. And when I told them, they said, that, that's exactly what we were doing. It was just amazing. I can suddenly see everything around. And then I saw my, my siblings and I started looking at it. But I, I remember when I was looking at my daughter, I said, but she's going to be okay. So it's okay. There was no... No attachment anymore. I was not suffering for her. I just said, she's going to be fine. There was so much love I felt for her and for my family and everybody that I just knew it was okay. So I just went up and I could still climb up. And then I saw like what I thought it were, they were children running all around. It was all of this childhood just playing around there, all the noises and, and voices and music and it was just beautiful. It was just a blast looking at all of this. And it was just uh, the love I felt around this. Is, it was just like getting into my family. And first I thought I didn't know anybody, but then it was just like everybody were friendly with me. And I believe in my heart that they were probably old souls and younger souls, or I don't know, but this is what I saw because I just went on, I was just floating, couldn't control this. And then I saw uh, ages like me, like in the 40s. I mean, it was not an age because it was, it's not about age. It's just what you feel. It's the knowledge around them. And again, there was so much love and people looking at, uh, at me. And it was, I felt very welcome. I just, the only thing I could tell you is that I felt a lot of love and peace. It was so peaceful. And then again, I could see my daughter and I could, I was conscious about everything. And then I could communicate with everybody and everything was okay. There was no more pain, no more suffering. So I just said, okay, I saw my daughter again. For me, that was perfect. And then I went up and then I saw these older souls, I think. And I could just see there was, in my human mind, I wanted to see things like humans. So I, I said, there, were, there are no wheelchairs. Nobody's using, so I know they're all, but, the, but they're very healthy. So that's my human mind trying to put words in this. And then there was a moment, this is, this is like the tree I was going through. This is what I believe I was, I was and I was looking at all these phases. I didn't understand anything. I just knew it was perfect. Everything was perfect. And then there was this yellow, that's why I'm at the cover of my book. I'm gonna show it uh, in a little bit, it's yellow, because it, there, it was just like a circle on top of me. There was this round circle and I was just floating, floating and I wanted to go through it. So I just went inside and then I felt, just imagine like if you open a door and there's this a lot of wind and energy and I was full of that energy and this beautiful embrace of light and I felt in heaven. It was just absolutely wonderful. I couldn't see anything there. I just felt a hand on top of my head. And these beautiful boys that I still, and I'm, I'm feeling it right now. Every time I tell this story, I feel it over and over again. And I really remember that this voice saying, go back in peace, stay calm, and do everything I've told you. And immediately I went down and all these steps brrr, and came back into my body. And boy, it hurt. It did hurt. I, I didn't want to be there. I was just so angry. But at that moment, I didn't understand I was dying. I was just so angry at the doctors. And I remember listening 
she's back, she's back, we got her. And then my heart beep, 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 beep. And I was, okay, who's back? I, I, I was, was just so confusing. And then, I, oh, my body, I felt that I was going round and around because of such lack of oxygen. And I remember being so angry at doctors and in my human life, I mean, thinking as a human being, I said, these doctors are so, uh, I mean, they're so selfish. They just want to have me alive and awake. I mean, not alive, I, they, I, I didn't know I was dead. They want me awake and I just don't want to be awake. I want to sleep again because I thought I was sleeping. So I went again into a respiratory rest and a heart. It, it, it was probably one of the doctors said it took around an hour since they could have me completely back. So I went on and off for a long time because in my mind and heart, I didn't want to come back. It was very difficult. And then I was so sick after that. I finally understood that I mean, I wanted to be back. I, I remember trying to write, where was I? I wanted to ask doctors, I wanted to, but I, they, they just thought I was very sick. They didn't want to talk to me or tell me anything. But I remember one night I was so, so sick that uh, I was crying out loud so hard that I, I went to, uh, uh, there was, and it was, I was very alive at this moment. I went crying, my sister was there and I said, I just want this to be over. I just, because I was really sick after this, even though that after my, after my new death experience, doctors asked me, how do you feel? Are you okay? And I said, yes, I'm like Hulk. I feel perfect. I mean, I was in two, so I just did like that, but I was very sick. So, but I felt strong just after that. But then after they uh, took the tube off, I remember they kept me because I was one bacteria after another bacteria, a lot of infections. It was very complex. So I remember one night that I started crying. My, my sister was there and I just said, I just want to be healed. I just want this over. This is, this is enough. I just want to go back to my family. So then again, I started praying. And this image I'm showing you, it's exactly how I saw it. This is the most similar thing I found. I was just playing on awake and I saw one light on one side, just like this. It was not like they had wings, it was wings. It was just like a lot of bright light, light on one side and then on the other one. And then they start cleaning me, all of my body. And they, I felt how they were cleaning. They started from my head and then my arms. And I just looked at them like, who is this? What are they doing? And my, my sister was there and she, she didn't know what was happening to me, but she just know I, I was just like in a shock or something. And then I went back to sleep, probably for, I don't know, eight or nine hours. And I didn't know that crying one of, was one of the biggest healings I had because I needed, I needed to clean up my lungs. And the best thing is for you to use this to be breathing and breathing. So when I cried, I really, it really helped a lot. Next day, a friend called me and told me, I had, um, well, they, they, you know, the, these phones with a big cord, they said, this is a friend that says that she really needs to talk to you. I didn't know what had happened. But then next day, she said, you know, I had a dream last night and I dreamt that there were angels healing you. So I just, I just want to tell you that you're going to be okay. If I could have a chance, I should have, I mean, I would have come out of my bed shouting and I would have said, yes, this happened to me yesterday. I went over this. So, so yes, yeah, there were angels around me, taking care of me, healing me. So yes, I got healed. And the, the thing that really healed me was when I received my daughter at the hospital, they said, they, we don't know if she's going to see her again. So let's bring her to her. So they brought her to me and something happened in five days that I was released out of the hospital just after I saw my daughter. So I prayed for this, you know, I asked for this and, and she was there. This is the last day I was in the hospital. This is my mother. And then after this, what has happened to me just after this is like Dr. Yvonne was telling you, I've been having a lot of dreams. I'm sorry, oops, beautiful dreams and 
most of them are with people that have passed. At the beginning, I was very frightened. I didn't understand. But then I understood that there were messages that people were communicating through me for their loved ones. At the beginning, I, I didn't want to talk about it. And then I started having several of them. One of the biggest ones is probably the, the one, I'm, I'm going to tell you a little bit about this, this dream, is that I was sleeping at two o'clock in the morning. And this has been, I'm just going to tell you one or two of them, but it, it's been amazing. And then I remember seeing a friend, a very close friend, that there was a long time since I didn't see her. We were working together. And then she came to me in a very vivid way. And then she said, Anna, how are you? And, you know, I want to invite you. We were at the beach. There was a beautiful scenery. And she said, look here, I have a big project for you and I. Why don't you come with me? Let's do it together. And I said, you know, I, I, I can't go now. There's a lot of things I have to do. But I see it's going to be beautiful that I just go ahead because we had already done several things together. So she said, let's do this. As you and I are going to do wonderful things together. So come with me. And I said, I just can't go now, but I will be there. Please wait for me. And I remember embracing her. And I remember just telling her, it's going to be perfect. Go ahead. It's going to be fine. Just enjoy it. So I woke up and the first thing I did now with technology, uh, I WhatsApp, uh, sent her a WhatsApp message, Facebook message, I, everything messages I had, I phoned her and no answer. So I, uh, that was at noon, I called another friend, a mutual friend, and I said, I, I just can't find there. where is she? And she said she passed at two in the morning and she was at the beach with her family. So it was just, she came to me to say goodbye. That was amazing for me. This is one of them. And then the other one, which was very strong, is a very good friend of mine passed. And several days later, he said, I need you and in a dream. He appeared and he said, you know, I'm just fine, but I need for you to talk to my parents. Tell them that when they walk through the lake, I mean, through the river, I'm always with them and I'm thinking about them. And I said, how am I, where did you, I didn't even know where the, his parents live. I didn't know anything. And he said, and please talk to my friend and tell him that I'm okay, that he's my wonderful friend that don't worry that I'm doing fine. It took me several weeks till I first decided to talk to my friend's wife. And I told him, you know, I had these dreams, but it was so strong that I want to talk to you about it. Well, to make the story short, I talked to, 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 this, to this man and he kept crying. And he said, I was so sad because I thought Jorge was so mad at me because I couldn't go visit him before he died. And now you're telling me that he's fine and that I'm his great friend. And then he's, I told him, but yes, but he said that you knew that parents, uh, Jorge's parents live by a river. And he said, yes, they moved some time ago and they're precisely by a river. I didn't know any of this. So I went to his parents, he took me and I talked to his parents about this. And they said, wow, we knew something was happening because we, well, all of these things, they happened over and over again. So I started believing that my dreams meant something. This is my daughter. And then I, of course, I didn't have more children, but they adopted my son, Daniel. And this is my beautiful, my beautiful family. And these are some messages I want to leave you with. I learned that those who do not enjoy life in the condition they have had to live, they end up dying before the burial. So I understood that I, I, that's why I tell you, I want to, one of these days I'm gonna have to leave this body because I'm not dying, but I leave this body and I wanna be very alive when this happens. Another thing is that I decided not to see the dangers and the difficulty of my journey, but the possibility of getting where I wanted. This is what I've learned through all of this, the joy of living. And I understood that it is a gift. It's really a gift and a great privilege to be alive. And I, well, this was, sorry. So this, this, all of these things that I'm doing now are part of my journey. Now, uh, what I'm doing, besides all of this that I'm telling you, with my heart condition, I'm 
57 years old. I'm very happy to say it because I never thought I was going to be this to get to this age and I feel more alive than ever. And I believe I have a great purpose and I'm helping these different, these hospitals uh, at Tech Salud, this is in Mexico. I'm constantly helping them at Methodist in Houston. I'm part of the, uh, the advisory board for people with heart conditions. Uh, Cardiac Javitas is a, is a, it's an organization that helps children with heart conditions. I constantly talk with par parents, with families, with children. So my life really, God has a very big purpose. And of course I have Spiritual Awakenings International. And I'm like, like Dr. Ivan was saying, I'm the, I'm the chair in the Spanish committee. I'm, I'm very, very blessed to be part of this beautiful organization. I'm, I have a YouTube channel and I'm, I feel very honored to have, be a, an affiliated group to Sai. So all of this, what I can tell you is that, let me see if this, this is a picture when I turned 50. I never thought I was going to get 50. So I, uh, a friend of mine said, yours, because I was just thanking God and thanking the universe to be alive. And then she said, please stay like that. And then I didn't even know she was taking pictures from me. So this is a beautiful picture that she took. And then I just wanted to say this message. I, I, I trust, oh, I can hardly read it because it's also covering it to me, from me. Okay, I trust that whenever I die, I'm gonna to try to say it. In the eternal embrace, yes, I will have a whole new heart that will live forever. This is, this is something, by, I, I know I, I'm gonna get a beautiful heart in this, in this eternal embrace, which uh, like, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna tell you what one of the priests, when I shared this in a, in a church told me. He said, no, no, God doesn't need to give you any heart. Your heart's already very beautiful. And I, well, I, I feel grateful for life. I, I, I'm grateful for God. I'm grateful for everything that I've been given in spite of that. And well, I really appreciate all of you to allow me to share my story. Uh, this is part of what I do now. This is my, my webpage. This is all of my social media. I have a YouTube channel where we also broadcast whenever we're going to have, uh, how do you, when we are going to have uh, some talks inside, we're going to be broadcasting those things there too. And uh, this is all of my, all of my social media, my book, as, uh, as Yvonne was telling you, and uh, Dr. Yvonne was telling you, it's in paperback and Kindle. And this is the tree I, close to what I saw. And this is me and my daughter. I don't know if it's my daughter who brought me back or I came back to her, but the thing is that this picture means a lot. That's why this is a, the, the, the cover of the book. So with this, I'm, I'm very grateful. I'm finished and I'm open to all the questions and answers you wanna ask. And thank you for giving me this time to share. Wow. Wow. Thank you, Anna. A number of people are clapping. What an amazing, beautiful presentation that was. Just incredible. Um, I'll invite anybody who has any questions for Anna, uh, please go ahead and write your questions into the chat and Anna will be happy to answer them. Um, I'll start sure. in with the first question while we're waiting for people to, uh, to write their questions is that, um, I mean, as a medical doctor, when you describe, you know, the congenital condition that you were born with, it, it really strikes home that it's, you know, really was not compatible with life. So you are a miracle. And um, I'm just so happy that, uh, that you've been healed and that you're with us. I mean, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I wanted to uh, ask you a question while we're waiting for some other questions, which is those out of body experiences that you had as a child, now that you've learned more about near death experiences and childhood near death experiences, do you think that some of them might have been near death experiences in your childhood? Because I do. <laughs> 
Yes, I, I think, for example, when I talked about that high hypothermia, I I saw myself, and then I, I mean, I've been remembering, recalling all of this, and I mean, I know it. The thing is that you never talk about these things because I just thought it was just like my imagination. But I remember being in the pool with it was my grandfather's uh, ranch, and I remember seeing everybody from the top, mm -hmm. and then I was just there laying with this little towel, and then um, and there was a. Uh, Everybody else was swimming and I saw all the family and I was just getting further and further. And I remember that suddenly I felt my father embrace me and then it's when I felt something back again. But I remember having those moments that I just went out and looking, looking at the ranch and looking at a lot of things very far away. And then when my father came to me and he tried to warm me up, it's when I went back. But I remember trembling, my, you know, I don't know how you call that, that all your teeth start, they, they don't stop. And I just, I couldn't even open my eyes. So I think that I had several of those because I do remember looking at things at a very far away. I even recall seeing oceans and seeing when I was a little girl. But I thought I was flying in my imagination <laughs> because I remember I moved my feet like this and I go further and further. I, I just thought all the time it was just my imagination. But yes, I do remember having several moments, even in my own house, uh, when I was very sick at some time, having, I had a flu. I remember walking on top of my parents' bedrooms. And, and I just thought it was my mind at that time. But yes, now, now after thanks to Spiritual Awakenings International, I understood that I have had many STEs that I didn't even know about. Mm -hmm. And I just named them now thanks to you all. So yes, I think I've had several. <laughs> I think you have too. Uh... All right, so we do have a few questions coming in, Anna. Um, okay, uh, so Tim Hawk asks, Anna, did you feel like the same person during your experience as a personality, or did you feel that a sorry, did you feel a little, a very different being at that time? How did the experience? And second question, how did the experience change your current life? Yes, it, it definitely changed absolutely. I feel sometimes I, I don't think that it's like everything is new, but the, it's just like if I remembered who I really was. It was just like bringing back things to me. And yes, uh, I saw that life in a very different way after that. Uh, I, I was married. I had been married for some time. And some years later, just we couldn't see the same things. And I, I got separated from my husband precisely because because I, 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 everything for me, for example, helping people was just like so natural. And we, we got into constant fights. Like I, if somebody came, it's very common in Mexico that people come to your door asking for money or asking for help. And if I had 500 pesos in my wallet, I just wanted to take it out and yes, give it. And my husband said, no, how are you going to give that money? If that's everything you have in, in your wallet. And I said, but I'm going to get some later. So everything started changing slowly. The way I, I saw life, like it, it was like if I wanted to, to embrace everybody, I saw people different, very different from what I was looking at them before. For me, they were just people that wanted, everybody was struggling, everybody was going through things. So I felt that I felt a big amount of love for everybody, even though from people I don't even know. I remember that I always like to make eye contact. And for me, this is a way to, to, to love people, to, I mean, to just connect. And I remember friends and people said, don't do that. They're gonna feel you want, you're like insinuating something or not. So it was just getting back here, it was heavy. It was for me the first uh, months or the first year, it was a very difficult year because I really didn't end up understanding where I was. I, and I, I tried to talk to a lot of people and everybody shut me down. I talked to a priest and he said, you know, this is a beautiful story. Just keep it to yourself. Don't talk about this because nobody will understand. 
I talked to a, a pastor and he said, wow, this is a beautiful experience. This is the way God talks to us through dreams. So just, just keep it to yourself again. And then I talked to a psychologist, to a psychiatrist, and I tried to explain, but I know I was someplace else. I just know it because the love I feel, the way I feel I was embraced, I've never in my life felt such love. So yes, it did change my life. And one of the biggest things, just answering your question, is that I'm absolutely not afraid of dying anymore at all. This is not something that I'm fear of at all. I just know that there's not such thing as dying. It's just life goes on in different ways. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. I, I hope I have answered the question. Thank you, Anna. <laughs> Uh, Tamara has a question for you. She says, yeah. Anna, how do you interact today with Raphael? Does he help you with healing not only yourself, but others too? Well, thank you, Tamara. Now that you were asking that question, I just, I want to go back a little bit and recall one of the moments. And this is because Tamara introduced me again to horses. But because when I was at around 10, this is one of my, another ST that I had. I was, I was with a friend at a ranch riding horses and it was extremely cold, very, very cold. So I started freezing. I couldn't move my hands anymore. I, I, I couldn't even open my eyes. And I remember seeing Raphael, Raffle, my Raffle on the right, also riding a horse. And it's like, like if he was riding with me and I said, no, 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 just go away. I don't want to leave yet. Just please don't take me with you. And that was for me, one of the biggest moments I remember just thinking that he was a ghost that wanted to take me away, but then didn't. And then uh, I, I did have almost fainted and my mother's friend had to take me and then to the fireplace and just warm me up and I was, I was gone for a while. So how, for, for me, that, that moment get, started letting me know that Raphael was not that ghost of death. But yes, how does Raphael work with me now? I, I think he's, he's been with me all the time. It's different when I was a little girl because he came up so natural. You know, suddenly he appeared and I was, that was it. And now what I, what I, I do interact with him a lot. I just had two ablation surgeries. Well, I say to him, but because I don't know if it's him or her, but I, let's call him him because it's easier. And because of the drawing I did, I believe it's like him. And, and I remember just having a two, I just had two, two heart ablations last year. And I remember talking to him, telling I know you're here. And I feel immediately what, I, what happens to me when I feel him is that I feel uh, tingling around my body. You know, I feel, I feel him and I know he's there. In, when I was younger, I saw him. It was so clear. Now I, I most feel him. And I immediately feel, for example, when I'm, when I'm driving, I usually, my daughter lives in the States, so we drive, it's about three hour drive. So I constantly drive and I immediately, before I get in the car, I say, okay, Raffle, are we ready? And I, I can see his image walking by me. It's, it's, it's amazing how I, I feel his protection and I know my heart condition is still serious, but I feel very healthy. So I believe that uh, being sick is also a state of mind. So I, don't, I think that Raphael is constantly walking with me through all this journey and I know he'll be with me. I think he's part of my life till I, have to leave this earth. So yes, he's constantly with me. I hope that answers your question, Tamara. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. Uh, Daryl has a question. He says, I believe you said trusting is important and I believe in miracles. Might these both help, help you recover from the unhealable? Trusting and believing in miracles. <laughs> I, is that a question? I, I, yeah. I think I didn't understand. Is okay. trusting and believing? Uh, he says, uh, does trusting and believing in miracles, oh. might that have helped you recover oh, from the unhealable? I, yes, I'm absolutely convinced that this is what I call faith. 
you, you trust and you believe that things are going to happen in my mind, in my soul. The thing, you know, what happened to me, that's why I call that title visualization. I don't know if it was incorrect because of this uh, technical things that happen, but I visualized things and I trusted and I believed that they were going to happen even before they did. And what I've said always is that, for example, I always thought that I was in my mind and soul, that I was going to grow up, I was going to be, I, I started, I'm a lawyer, and I started law precisely thinking about justice, being justice with, and that's, that's, a, that's a big story also about my, why did I start law? Because I said, why am I here and not others are here? And part of this I explain in my book. So that's another, another reason if you want to look at it. But I believe that one of the things that really helped me was that I believed in my mind that things were going to happen. And nowadays, for example, my, my daughter's married. I hope one of these days I'm going to be a grandma. That's one. I've always been dreaming for, for more and more things. But you know what I say is that if I don't get things or if they don't come before I die, in my mind, in my heart, I already enjoy them deeply. So yes, I believe that trusting and believing in things, you bring them, I think we create things with what we think. So uh, in a way we are creating them, even though you don't have them here, in your mind you do. So that make, makes me happy, make me enjoy life. And I believe that what, that's one of the reasons that my body has been healing itself constantly because I'm aiming for a lot more. So doctors told me that I should tell my story precisely because of this. He said, they said, we don't have many explanations, but you must have. So I do believe that my mind, my thoughts, my, my, my meditating constantly, because this is something I've, I'm constantly doing several times a day, just breathing. Breathing has, me, has been life for me. Why? Because this gets back my body into oxygen and it gets me back into my center. I mean, it gets me back into the connection with what really matters. So yes, I believe that trusting and believing in your mind, soul and body has helped me. I do believe it, yes. Wonderful, wonderful, Anna. We have quite a few more questions. Uh, Dr. Francis Liu asks, I may have missed it, but you say, uh, can you say more about your religious background and participation in religion, in rituals, practices, and faith communities? To what extent did your religious background help you or hurt you with your understanding and your integration of your STEs? Uh, that, that's a very, very good question that nobody had ever asked me and I wish someone did before. And thank you, Lenny. It's difficult because yes, I was raised in a Catholic church. My parents were Catholic and I do believe that their faith helped me to believe that I was gonna be alive. Just the fact that my father told me when I was very young, well, that's what doctor says, that's the diagnosis, the prognosis is that I, you're gonna die soon. But what if God, God has another plan? So just believing that there, there was something else that I could trust in not only science and not only medical issues made me strong inside. And it helped me a lot until I started questioning a lot of things, of course. So I, I was raised like that and I, I've always felt that I'm a very spiritual person, not a religious person. I've never been religious, really. I mean, I, I, I understand and I respect all these uh, practices and everything, and my parents have been there all the time. But for me, what happened mostly after my near-death experience is that I opened my heart. You know, one of the experiences I had in the hospital when I was, uh, I was out of intensive care, but I was still sick. And then one of the things I did, I don't know why, well, I do know why, they ask you, what religion are you in? And I didn't answer. I wanted to meet everybody that wanted to come in my room. So everybody knocked at the door and I said, we come from this place and then we come from the Anglican and we are Jewish and we're, is it okay? Yes, come in. 
And now everybody, I wanted everybody in, and everybody prayed for me. Everybody asked me if they could ask for whatever. So it was such a blessing meeting all of these wonderful people from everywhere. And I understood that religion sometimes divided us instead of uniting us. So I wanted no religion. So that was a beautiful experience for me to start meeting a lot of people from everywhere and all their, what, what do they wish for me? They just wish me well. So don't, you don't need a religion for people to wish you well. So I said, okay, we don't need to be in one religion, but I do think that my parents' upbringing may, may help me a lot to believe, to be faithful. I've, I've read the Bible all over again. I mean, it, it's been, it's something very familiar to me. And what I did at some point, I was, I was in Bible classes, I was teaching Bible, and, but all of these things have been, have been changing. And, and what, I, what I'm doing now is just trying to help people in any way I can, in, if it's in a spiritual way or if it's in a, just comforting them. I'm very close to everything that has to do with children and family with, with heart conditions. And with this kind of organizations like Spiritual Awakenings International, because I believe that part of the purpose I received was when I, they, he said, go back and do everything I told you, is precisely share the love and share uh, the, the, the raising awareness of who we really are. This is part of, this is part of what Spiritual Awakenings International helps me do. So that's my upbringing, and I do believe that religions sometimes definitely divide us mm -hmm. instead of uniting us. I, I hope that answers the question. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. Definitely. Uh, Diela has a question for you, too. She says, hi, Anna. How would you describe your experience of what God was like from your interaction with God? How God was like, well, I don't, I think everybody that I know of, including me, were always, always missing words to try to explain what we went through. I don't think there's words that, that, that can, it's just like if I try to explain how does an apple taste or how does juice taste or papaya or any flavors, or uh, it's, it's just, what I, I can just describe love. It was just not something physical. It was just the, the everything. I knew he was there. I knew it was there. It's, that's why sometimes, I think that that's why sometimes we just, this light, beautiful light blinds us. Because if we saw everything, I don't know if we could still be talking and being reasonable with human beings. I mean, I don't know. I just have, have this idea that, that there's so much information we don't really know of, know about yet. There's so much to discover in the spiritual world that I, the, only, the only way I can tell you is that I felt embraced, protected, loved. I felt safe, very safe. That's the best way I can describe God. I don't know if that's the answer you were expecting. Wow. Very beautiful. Very beautiful, Anna. <laughs> Anna Morales has a, a question for you, a comment and a question. She says, I love your story. Thank you for sharing. The pandemic has awoken so much collective fear towards health and death. Considering what you experienced on the other side, can you say something about this that I can, that can bring us peace and hope during these very uncertain times? Well, if it's the Anna, I believe that I believe that's my daughter. <laughs> so I, I hope I hope she's she's around there. But yes, yes, this has been difficult. And I know uh, what she's talking about. What I what I can tell you, and this is something that I've been telling her and and many, we we cannot avoid uh, the part of what being a human being uh, has with, I mean, it brings sometimes being sick, 
It brings sometimes being sad. It brings a lot of things around. Just, just the fact of being a human is risky, just being in this world, because anything can happen any moment. But I believe that we should look beyond that and our minds should not be set on the, on the virus or on the pandemic or on whatever. Just, just be responsible with your body. What I, what I think is what I've done with me physically, I mean, talking about my body, is that I've always taken care of it, having a, feeding my body really well, exercising my body, trying to keep it as safe as possible. If I know, if I know I'm gonna go into a place that everybody's sick, well, I won't go there. I just try to take very good care of my physical body. But my mind is not on this crazy thing that can kill us all if we just, I, I, I believe that our, our minds should be just really taking care of ourselves and believing that this also shall pass. This is just part of, of being humans. And this is something, I mean, this happened a hundred years ago with so many things that have come and gone, come and gone. Some of us are still alive and some of them went away. I just don't think, and I, this is something I'm gonna share what I told my, um, to my daughter. I don't think you're gonna help God, not even a bit, to take me away whenever it's my time. So don't worry about if I'm going to, I'm going to uh, get you conta contagious, or if that's the word, if I'll help me with that. I mean, I, I'm not gonna help you with that or uh, someone's gonna help me that. No, no, if it's my time, it's my time. I already have a plan. So sometimes I feel, we feel so anxious of so many things. Just take care of yourself, the, the more, in, in the more uh, being conscious with what's best for you, what is best for another, maybe it's not the best for me, but just be fair to yourself and understand that, that we, we have a plan in this world and nothing is really going to come and make it go faster or sooner or later. It's just the way you consider to take care of yourself what's the best way. Just love everybody the way everybody believes. I don't believe in in imposing rules and this is what's got to be, but I do believe in respect, love, and just taking care of yourself the way the best way you think is best for you, and wish you all respect that. Beautiful, thank you, Anna. We have a number of very lovely comments. You know, okay. people that are very, very grateful oh, and thank uh, saying how beautiful your presentation is. Uh, but uh, I, I actually have another question, which is, can you tell us the story, please, about that beautiful heart? It's hanging on the door behind you there, and you use that picture. Yeah. Can you tell us the story about that heart, please? Well, you see, Eva, that's why I, I shouldn't have my screen. I wanted to put a screen, and there was no way I could put a, a background instead of this. This, this is uh, my logo, the one I use for everything now, because uh, there was a friend that she, she designed it. And the first thing I saw in this heart is that I believe it's beautiful, but it's, it's got several lines, which means my surgeries. I've gone through a lot of, of interventions, some, uh, a lot of catheterizations. Everybody has gotten, I mean, not everybody, but many doctors in many ways have gotten in my heart. Mm -hmm to heal it, to take information for many, many things. So this represents all the ways my, my heart might, might have surgeries, might be broken in, in a physical way, but it's still beautiful and strong. So for me, this has been the representation of my, my heart, what I've been going through. But even though it's had a lot of surgeries and sort of cut, cuts and whatever, it's still hanging in there, and I believe it's it's beautiful. <laughs> I, I love blue and red. <laughs> so that's what it means. That's the story of that heart. 
I think it's lovely with all the stitch work on it too. Yes, you know? all, but all still, that, exactly. still beautiful. I think that's wonderful. Well, we've reached the end of our questions. There are lots of beautiful, beautiful comments. So I just want to, on behalf of everyone, thank you, Anna, for an incredible heart touching <laughs> presentation that's really, really inspiring. So join me, everybody, in a round of applause for Anna. It was absolutely incredible. Thank you so very much for sharing. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. And I'm now going to turn it over to uh, Robert Baer, who's going to give some closing announcements. Thank you, Dr. Kason and Anna Cecilia. You know, that was fantastic. Great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you. Much. Um, a couple closing remarks. SAI presents online speaker events the third Saturday of each month, just like today is the third Saturday. Our next SAI Presents event is Saturday, March 19th. Peter Panagor is going to be speaking. He's a great speaker. He's going to talk about the Great Global Awakening, Science, NDE, Mysticism, and a Hope for Humanity. That, again, that's March 19th. SAI is hosting our next SAI Experiencers Sharing Circle on Saturday, March 5th. I don't know if you've attended a, a, an SAI Experiencers Circle, but for me, it's one of my favorite things. It's, you get to see people from all over the world and they talk about their individual experiences. It's really a neat thing. But our SAI Experiencers Sharing Circles are the first Saturday of every month except of course, January. This year, that happened to be New Year's Day. So we hold our Espanol language events the second Saturday of every month. And you'll be able to see Anna Cecilia Gonzalez there and also Francisco Valentin. He's in the, uh, he's in the uh, audience here. Uh, and Dr. Ingrid Hunkala. And the next Spanish event, um, Saturday, March 12th, Anna Cecilia Gonzalez is going to be presenting her presentation in Espanol. So please register for all events and sharing circles on our SAI website. And please check out our beautiful SAI website. It has a lot of information about STEs and you have our English, which was primarily done by uh, Dr. Quezon and in our Espanol, which was translated by Anna Cecilia Gonzalez. And if you have not yet subscribed to SAI, please do so to get the announcements for our upcoming speaker events. That's www.spiritualawakeningsinternational.org. Thank you once again, back to Dr. Quezon. Thank you again, Anna Cecilia. Thank you, Robert. Mm -hmm. So uh, I just wanted to uh, remind everyone that the video of this uh, and all of our SAI Presents events um, are posted on our SAI website. This one will take a couple of days till it's been edited and then it will be on our SAI website. It's already up on our SAI Facebook page if you're eager to share it with your friends or see it again. Uh, and uh, just to remind all of you that we are donation based and uh, we are striving to keep all of our events free for everyone around the world, regardless of their financial situation. So if you're able to uh, make a small donation of gratitude, we appreciate it or a large donation of gratitude, whatever moves you in your heart. Anyway, with that, I'd like to say uh, goodbye till next time to everyone. So uh, au revoir, au revoir, adieu, hasta la vista, arrivederci, doch, farvel, <laughs> ciao, and aloha. Bye everybody, till next time. <laughs>